warmest welcome to the Environmental Law Institute. My name is Caitlin McCarthy and I'm the director of the Associates Program here at ELI. You have joined us for Basics of Land Use Law, part of ELI's annual summer school series. We're delighted to welcome everyone here today in person and online, and I encourage you to follow the events page on our website, eli.org, for future events and the next summer school series seminars. For our audience members on GoToWebinar, we encourage you to ask a question by submitting it through GoTo's question box. And please do not hold your questions until the end. Send them as soon as you think of them. For our audience in the room, we'll have Q&A at the end, so keep in mind your questions for them. I'd like to thank our wonderful panel for being here today to teach us land use law. The recording and the PowerPoints of today's seminar will be available on our website within the next week. Full speaker bios are posted on our website, eli.org, but I would like to take a moment to introduce our outstanding panel. So to start, we have Sarah Everhart is an adjunct professor, research associate, and legal specialist with the Agriculture Law Education Initiative at the University of Maryland Francis King Carey School of Law. She began practicing law in Maryland in 2005, and her expertise include land use law, as well as labor law and environmental policy. Sarah graduated from Washington College and received her law degree cum laude from Pace University Law School with an environmental law certificate. Thank you for joining us, Sarah. Diana Norris serves as the in-house counsel with the Piedmont Environmental Council. An experienced litigation manager, Diana has demonstrated history of working in the nonprofit organization management industry. Diana received her Bachelor of Arts from Cornell, her Master of Arts from American University, and her JD from Columbus School of Law at Catholic University. Welcome, Diana. Thank you. Megan Robert Satinsky is an associate at Linoz and Blocker in the firm's environmental land use and litigation practices. She combines legal analysis with a strong scientific background in her extensive land use practice. Prior to her current role, Megan worked as a senior environmental scientist and in private practice. She received her Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science from Virginia Tech, her Master of Science in Environmental Science from Towson University, and her JD magna cum laude and a Certificate of Concentration in Environmental Law from the University of Maryland Law School. Glad you could join us, Megan. Thank you. And with that, I will turn things over to Sarah to start our panel today. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And thank you everyone for coming. Um, okay. All right, so I have been given the task of kind of giving a little bit of historical overview and then talking about some of the um, legal authority for land use planning. So stay with me. Um, this is probably not the most fascinating part of the talk, but I will try to keep you all awake. And I know it's lunchtime and the air conditioning feels really good in here considering how hot it is outside. Um, so be simple ownership to land. Um, it comes with certain rights that are protected by law. So what are some of the fundamental property rights? When we buy property, when we own property, what are some of the things that we have the right to do with that property? Interactive, come on, shout it out, what do you think? Exclude other people from coming on our property. Exclude other people, I think that's America's favorite thing to do with property, get off my lawn, right? Yeah, you have a right to kick people off, exactly. You have a right to possess the property, you have a right to alienate the property. Um, you have a right to use the property. That's one of my personal favorites. Um, I have the right to live on my property to, um, you know, my husband was enjoying his right to mow our grass last night. <laughs> so that's really the foundation of land use law is this push and pull between the things that we have the legal rights to do and then how that's gonna impact others. So how many of you own property? Raise your hand. How many of you want to own property? <laughs> okay, so everyone should be interested. Whether you own property now, when I was sitting in this seat and I used to come to these when I was a summer intern in DC, I did not raise my hand for the own property, but I did want to own property. Um, and so everyone should be interested in land use law and I hope today's program gives you a better understanding of some of your rights and some of the restrictions on those rights. So in the beginning, before there was planning and zoning, land use disputes were mostly based in nuisance. So before we had zoning designations, before we had these complex 100 page comprehensive plans, um, most of what land use law was about was really if someone's doing something so horrible that they're creating a nuisance, we're going to sue that person, bring them to court. And courts were having to deal with these types of issues on a piecemeal basis. Um, it was becoming burdensome um, and you know, we know the court system doesn't like that. So instead of dealing with it on a piecemeal basis, um, there was 
a push to try to create some overall rules. But still, because nuisance was the foundation of all of this, land use law is really based in those principles. Like I said, the balance of someone's right to use versus the impact on another's right to quiet enjoyment. So how do we keep that balance? So which came first, the zoning or the planning? What do you guys think? Zoning? Um, basically, yes. There was some city planning that went on. You know, we're sitting here in Washington, D.C. Obviously, there was a plan laid out for this city. So there was some city planning, but on a large scale basis, yes, the zoning came before the planning. In the early 1920s, there was the Standard State Zoning Enabling Act. Um, and if you've never taken a look at this, which unless you're a real land use dork, you probably haven't. <laughs> um, but if you're interested in zoning, if you're interested in land use, take a look at it. It's I think it's pretty fascinating with how closely this resembles current a lot of current zoning ordinances. You'll see, if you look at your jurisdiction zoning ordinance and then look at this, you'll go, my gosh, it's 2018. Not that many things have changed. The basic format for many jurisdictions isn't too far off of this. So 1924, um, this was published. And then, I mean, really why? Why did this happen at that time in history? Well, like I said, there was nuisance actions that were clogging up the courts and the courts didn't want to deal with that so much. And at that point in time, there was a lot of industrial booms. And so you had people living in cities and then you had industry booming and at, there wasn't much protection for those folks who were trying to buy property and maintain those residential uses. Maintaining and protecting, and protecting um, residential Housing and value, you'll see, is a theme and land you saw if you enter into this field. We're always trying to protect that single family residential um, use. So then in 1928, just a few years later, the Standard City Planning Enabling Act um, came about, and that really promoted the use of a separate comprehensive plan. So that was the planning. So just a few years later, However, because zoning in many jurisdictions came about before planning, it's not uncommon for um, local governments to struggle with how to marry these two together. How do we have zoning and planning? What's the relationship between the two? Okay, so what part of the Constitution allows states to regulate land use? Anybody have an idea? Yes, sir. Tenth Amendment, Tenth Amendment. good job. Um, exactly. This all came about, as you'll see, kind of by default. So the 10th Amendment says that the powers that aren't given to the federal government go to the states. Well, this is the allocation of power that results in the states being able to regulate how private land use um, is to be regulated. So the states have the power to pass laws to protect the public health, safety, and welfare. Health, safety, and welfare are referred to as the state's police power. So the state has the power because the federal government doesn't have it to pass laws to protect those issues. Um, and this is the basis for zoning and land use regulation. And again, in most instances, this is passed on to the local government. So because the feds don't have the power, the states get the power. And with land use and zoning, the states go, we don't wanna deal with that. That should be a local issue. So we're gonna, pass, we're gonna put in our state constitution or we're gonna put in, a, in some enabling legislation that local government should have that power. So this kind of gets, um, it's like a little game of uh, Plinko, beep, 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 goes down to the local governments and then the local governments end up with a lot of power, really. So it's pretty interesting um, in terms of an authority, um, we're looking at it in terms of legal authority and local governments are really the ones making the calls and um, shaping how this is formed. Some other sources of uh, constitutional authority that we have to think about in terms of uh, planning and zoning. The Fifth Amendment, um, seems like we're always talking about the Fifth Amendment, it's a good amendment. Um, so we have due process and takings protections in the Fifth Amendment. I have made the semicolon on the Fifth Amendment bold on purpose because you should really think about those two concepts separately. Sometimes they get confused. For a while, the Supreme Court was confusing them. So you should give yourself a pass if you've ever confused them yourself. Um, but the first part of it, um, nor shall any person be deprived of property without due process of law, is the due process protections of the Fifth Amendment. Then we have 
um, the takings protections, which says, nor shall private property be taken without just compensation. So we're, the Fifth Amendment, and we'll talk about the, the fact that this applies to the states through the 14th Amendment, but the Fifth Amendment due process says, um, we can't take things away from you in this country unless you get due process. And then the taking says, if we take something away from you, we got to pay you for it. And my colleagues here will get into that a little bit that in more detail in a minute. Um, takings generally occur when the property owner is deprived of reasonable and significant use of property. And this can be broken down into a physical taking. Someone just comes out and takes your property or the government decides they want to build something on your property. That's a physical taking. And then more common these days is a regulatory taking. So a law is passed and it curtails your use to such an extent that you feel like your property's been taken and you're owed compensation. Okay, so due process comes in two different forms that we deal with in land use law, um, substantive due process, and that's just the right to be free from unreasonable governmental interference. So that just means the government's <clears throat> messing way too much with those fundamental property rights. They've passed a law, and because of that law, I'm being deprived of those fundamental property rights. So a land use regulation, and I say regulation, I mean law by that term, any kind of zoning law, must be pursuant to a valid police power. So remember those police powers that the local governments ended up with, so they have the right to pass laws to protect the health, safety, and welfare. So in order to pass a land use regulation, it has to be for one of those reasons. So if you're passing a land use regulation that says we only want condos in this part of town, what's the basis for that? Is there, is that, and for some reason, are we doing that to protect the public health, safety, and welfare? And there has to be a connection, a rational connection between the restriction imposed and the legitimate governmental purpose. Okay, so you have to make that connection. And if you fail to make that connection, then the land use regulation is vulnerable to a substantive due process claim. So those are really the things to think about when we're talking about that type of due process. That's referred to as the rational basis test. And then I won't bore you with too much case law today, but we have to talk about the all-star case. We wouldn't be, I think we would get kicked out if we didn't talk about the Euclid case when we talk about land use law. So Euclid versus Ambler Realtor Company, this is a case back from 1926. Long story short, the development company owned 68 acres of land outside of uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Village Council, right time in history, remember we were talking about the early 20s is when this all kind of started. Um, they passed a zoning ordinance <coughs> and they did what village councils do with zoning. They divided this area up into different districts and said, you know, in this district you can do this, in this district you can have these types of uses, these types of buildings. Well, the development company wasn't too happy with that because their 68 acres spanned multiple zoning districts. And so they were, they were then significantly restricted with how they could use that land, which the facts of this case could definitely happen today. That happens all the time. Folks own property and it ends up in more than one zoning designation and they're not happy that they're restricted in what they could do. So they filed suit against the village. They claimed that the, there was a violation of the 14th Amendment. Um, and the due process and equal protection clauses, which we'll talk about in a minute. Thankfully, we wouldn't be here if the Supreme Court hadn't ruled this way. The Supreme Court ruled that zoning, as long as it's not done in an arbitrary or capricious way, is a valid use of police power. Um, the town claimed, so what were the basis, or what was, how did the town justify um, creating these districts? What was their police power foundation? They said that the zoning was needed so that fire departments could access the properties, so that we would decrease traffic, improve the overall quality of life for the residents. And I'm sure my colleagues would agree with me that these are the same types of reasons that are still in use today. We're always talking about police and fire protection, traffic, um, and those types of things, protecting property values when we're talking about establishing zoning districts. So this case really held out that there has to be a rational basis for zoning laws, but if there is a rational basis, such as the examples given in Euclid, 
then jurisdictions, a town or a county, whichever one you're dealing with here, have the right to do what they did. They have the right to establish districts. And did the development company take a financial hit in this case? Yes. Were they restricted? Yes. Just because somebody is financially impacted doesn't mean the law itself is legally unsound. So are, is there going to be some collateral damage? Yes. However, if they did it in a rational way, if they did it you know, with the proper legal foundation, the Supreme Court found it was a valid law. This case really was the tipping point and set off a proliferation of zoning across the country. So once the Supreme Court held this way, then local governments who were before trepidatious about getting into this because they knew that everybody that was financially impacted was going to turn around and sue and they didn't want to get into, involved with that. Once the Supreme Court did this, most jurisdictions went ahead and zoned zoned as far as you can see. You know, uh, there's not very many jurisdictions that don't have zoning nowadays. Okay. Procedural due process is the other part of the due process protections that's really important when we're talking about land use law. And this just means that citizens have a right to notice a pending government action. That when we're talking about zoning and planning, these are open things. These are very public proceedings. So you have the right to have notice of a public hearing. You have a right for cross-examination. Um, and all of these things, you know, these things are things that you all should be able to walk in and observe. Um, if there's a Board of Appeals proceeding, which is a quasi-judicial proceeding that we'll talk about, I mean, you have the right to be there. If they're creating a new comprehensive zoning plan for the area where you live, you have a right to be there and listen to this. Um, I think we're in an interesting place now with procedural due process because how many of you read a paper, a newspaper made of paper? Yeah, two hands in the room, exactly. So. Um, how many of you read a newspaper online? The newspaper, not anything else. Okay, more. Okay. Um, a lot of notices for land use proceedings are still in the paper. Um, and so if you're interested in these and you want to go observe them, read the newspaper, either the paper version or the online version, but they're in the newspaper. Um, and I think some jurisdictions are moving more towards, you know, you could go to the town website or the county website and get some kind of an alert but it's still a little bit old fashioned in that way. But we have to give people notice and we have to do this in a very open and public way. I bring this up and I, I harp on this because as attorneys, it is important to think about these things. Sometimes you end up in a informal proceeding and you have to kind of remind folks about some of these rights and, the, and the, this is, becomes an important thing. Planning commissions, boards of appeals, they're oftentimes comprised of people who are not lawyers um, and they're making these decisions and they don't really have a constitutional understanding of some of these rights or the importance of these rights. And even if you're representing a client and you're sitting there and, you know, the board is made up of a nurse and a mailman and maybe one lawyer and your client needs you you're sitting there with your client and there's no angry neighbors there so it doesn't seem like a very formal proceeding it's important that you still do things openly and fairly because if someone does appeal that case because procedural due process wasn't followed your client's not going to be very happy with you so it comes up in a lot of different contexts 14th amendment um so we know that no so this is the 14th amendment is where we have the due process of law and the equal protection protections extended to the states. So we've already talked about due process of law, but equal protection, it requires that any distinctions or classifications made by the regulations must be given similar treatments to similar persons in similar situations. That's a lot of similars. Um, sometimes I have found that students get a little tripped up with equal protection when we're talking about zoning, because the basis of zoning is that we're going to create these districts and we're going to treat people differently, right? We want to create divisions we want to create different classifications. And then we read the equal protection um, part of this amendment and we think we have to give everybody equal protection. So how does that square? How can we give people equal protection if the whole basis of zoning is treating people differently? Think about it as people in the same zone need to be treated similarly. So it's okay to create different zones. It's okay to create different classifications. But when you're talking about everybody in the R1 zone, all those folks should be treated different, should be treated the same rather. So we need equal 
treatment for the folks in the same zone. Um, classifications, typically they're permitted if they're rational and non-arbitrary, reasonable, like we were talking about before. However, if you go ahead and make classifications based on suspect classes, race, national origin, or if you start messing with people's fundamental rights, um, First Amendment rights, right to vote, right to interstate travel, that, that is going to be a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. Um, that's going to be subject to strict scrutiny and not likely to be upheld. So in Maryland, and I'm sure this translates to many other places, we've got a couple of basic zoning tools. Um, we, the first of which is a comprehensive plan. So we have comprehensive plans here in Maryland. They're done every 10 years. They're legislatively adopted by the local governing body. So they're adopted like a law. Um, they spell out the manner in which an area is going to be developed. They include maps showing the proposed future land uses, anticipated transportation, community facilities. These are very extensive plans. Has anybody ever looked at a comprehensive plan? A couple of you? Okay. I mean, they're usually about an inch to two inches thick. Um, so get yourself a cup of coffee when you get the comprehensive plan. Um, very important to review them carefully, review all of it, little details about your clients land could be sprinkled throughout um, you, these days quite a bit on environmentally sensitive areas and, um, and future goals including policies for protecting the environment like i said zoning and subdivision regulations so these are some more of the tools the zoning ordinance which we've been talking about the zoning law that's going to establish permitted uses and my colleagues here are going to talk about that a little bit more includes a zoning map the map is a legal document that's signed and dated don't go off of the map that's online on the county or town websites. Go down to the town office and make sure you're looking at the most recent valid map. Um, I don't want to cast any aspersions on millennials, but it is good to actually make that trip. Don't just rely on the technology. Um, a lot of times counties don't have the manpower or the time to keep their websites totally up to date and those zoning maps can change. It's very important to take a look, take the drive, get to know the folks at the town planning and zoning office. They will be your friends. Those relationships are important. So it's important to move past the technology and go in there and have a face-to-face -face interaction with those. The zoning ordinance amendments, um, they have to be drafted, or, uh, zoning ordinances have to be drafted in accordance with the comprehensive plan. Or if there's an amendment, it needs to be considered in accordance with the comprehensive plan. This is part of the reason why comprehensive plans are so important. Don't underestimate the power of the comprehensive plan. You may look at it and go, that's an eight-year-old document. That doesn't pertain to me. I'm here for a zoning ordinance amendment. Keep in mind that there's consistency requirements. And this, you know, this will vary by jurisdiction, but in Maryland, it's pretty clear that there needs to be some consistency with what you're asking for in the comprehensive plan. They have to um, be reasonable, um, there has to be reasonable consideration for other things too, like the character of the district, suitability for particular uses and that sort of thing. Subdivision ordinances, uh, they're very detailed parts of the law. And these really are gonna contain the procedures by which land is divided into individual building lots. So this is gonna tell you exactly how wide that cul-de-sac has to be in order for the fire truck to turn around. Um, very detailed, but very important if you're representing a client who is in need of development, or if you're representing a client who's not happy with the proposed development. So this is just a shameless plug part of my presentation. <laughs> land use law, the reason that I loved practicing and the reason that I love teaching about this subject is because it's unlike other parts of the law, it's intergovernmental and interdisciplinary. So it's not boring. You get to work with a large variety of people and you get to work in a lot of different forums. So you're sometimes you're in court, traditional court, sometimes you're in front of a quasi-judicial board, like a board of appeals, like I was saying before, sometimes you're in charge of, in front of the planning commission. Um, a variety of different issues. I like that the local governments get to exert the power. Um, sometimes it can be challenging, but uh, it keeps things interesting and things are constantly changing. You know, they adopt a new comprehensive plan or they approve some um, conditional uses, floating zones, that type of thing. It just keeps things interesting and fresh. Um, and you, you also get to work with a variety of different people, which is great. Um, if you're a people person, if you like working with non-lawyers, 
it would be great for you. I liked working with engineers, working with environmental experts, um, you know, nothing against lawyers, but sometimes we get a little much and it's nice to work with people who have different expertise and you get to work on a team, which is a nice thing. You're not just stuck in an office working independently. Some recommended resources for all of you. In Maryland, we have um, a planning commission education course. And I look at this uh, pretty regularly. I love to use this as a resource to kind of refresh myself. When I'm getting ready to teach this course again at University of Maryland Law School, I always take a look at this. Um, it's a great resource. It's on the Maryland Department of Planning website. You can sign up for uh, Patricia Salkin's um, Law of the Land blog. So weekly, she'll send you national cases that are of interest. And it's real easy just to read these cases. And it gives you a good overview nationally of some interesting land use cases. Attend your town or county planning commission or board of appeals proceedings. This one's really easy, but if you want to practice in this area or if you have a case or a client and you have a matter coming up, instead of being nervous about it or trying to guess how it's going to go, just go a month before and watch. Watch the board, see who's on the board, see how they're ruling on things, go to the planning commission. This is all open, like I said, that's the benefit of those procedural due process rights. So take advantage of them. Lastly, consider serving on a planning commission or board of appeals. Um, you know, this isn't always great. The warning on this advice is if you go into private practice and you're trying to get clients in that jurisdiction, your firm might not be too happy if you put yourself on a board of appeals and then your firm is conflicted out from representing people. But if you're not on a, in a private firm or you live somewhere, you know, you're not trying to get clients, consider being a part of it. They love people with law degrees on these boards. Absolutely love it. I, I did this when the economy took a downturn and my firm had no problem because I didn't think we could be getting any development work at that time. And it was great. It was a great experience and I learned a lot. So I encourage you to think about that. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah. That was great. Um, my name is Megan Roberts Satinsky. I'm an associate with Linnaeus and Blocker. I'm in pra private practice. My practice is about a third land use, a third environmental, and a third litigation related to environmental land use and real estate matters. And I wanted to give a thank you to Ryan Mitchell, who's here, who's our summer clerk, who helped me with this presentation today. So Sarah gave you like a really great overview. I'm going to give you sort of what it's like on the ground as someone in private practice. Um, my primary jurisdiction is Anne Arundel County, which is um, the, where our state capital of Maryland is located, Annapolis. So I'll give you examples from what I do on a daily basis in Anne Arundel County, but really it's so similar across the state, across jurisdictions. What I show you, you're going to be able to go to any local ordinance and generally see the same thing. So I hope that it is helpful. So as you know, Sarah mentioned um, that, that zoning is local government regulation of the land through you know, regulation of buildings and structures in accordance with general plan. And I include this note because Rathcroft Law of Zoning and Planning is sort of the Bible. If you know, whenever you read a case, you're gonna see references back to this treatise and it's really helpful if you sort of just need a general overview, it's a good place to start. So in Maryland, um, the, the state code land use article grants counties and municipalities the power to zone. It gives them powers and it also sets restrictions. Um, it sets certain requirements, such as the requirement to have a comprehensive or general development plan every 10 years. And it also, you know, sort of sets certain standards for consistency and certain approvals, such as special exceptions. Um, state and other federal laws also impact zoning regulations such as Maryland's critical area law, which protects the areas within 1,000 feet of tidal waters or um, mean high water of the Chesapeake Bay. It, it has very stringent environmental regulations. I'll talk about that. Um, growth tiers. In Maryland, we have growth tiers that set, you know, septic restrictions and that impacts growth. Priority funding areas, which encourages jurisdictions to target growth to certain areas. Preemption, medical cannabis, I'll talk about that a little bit. That's kind of the hot topic for a lot of us in the land use law. ADA, Fair Housing um, Act, such requirements, things like um, rehab facilities or drug treatment facilities, uh, assisted living facilities are given certain protections under the, federal, um, the Fair Housing Act, and local governments are restricted in the way that they can regulate protected um, land uses, and also, um, a federal act, called, we call it RELUPA, which protects 
religious land uses, churches, and essentially protects them from any sort of restrictive zoning. And it's challenged in federal court pretty frequently and the churches generally win. So if you come across any clients that are challenging a, a religious activity, you better look at that because it provides religious land uses a lot of protection. Um, so as Sarah said, you know, the local government, the counties, the cities, they adopt official zoning maps, which have to be, um, you know, consistent with the comprehensive plan, which the local planning and zoning office, who have professional planners and scientists and engineers that develop these plans, everything has to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. And then based on those um, recommendations, they enact the zoning regulations. So the zoning district, this is actually a screenshot from um, Anne Arundel County zoning map. Um, as you can see, it has beautiful colors. Uh, and the, um, the general, you can see that, um, that everything is sort of grouped together. Like sometimes the, the zoning map is reflective of what's, what is the use on the ground, you know? So is this an industrial park? Is this a commercial office space? Is this residential? The zoning map is reflecting what's actually on the ground. And other times in accordance with what the recommendations are in the comprehensive plan, with the zoning map on an area that perhaps is undeveloped or, you know, has been developed for a long time will reflect something that's possibly not on the ground at that time and is an aspirational, you know, way to target development and growth in a certain direction. So you might have an old office park that occupies a portion of the, the parcel, but overall the area is zoned residential because the planning and zoning office and the comprehensive plan have decided that this is a good place for residential development. So, you know, this is the first place that you're gonna go to figure out, you know, here's a piece of property, what is the baseline regulation? And you'll see it's sort of in the center, it's kind of interesting, the little green bit, it's open space zoning. So not, you know, the, the, um, the zoning districts reflect sort of what you would traditionally think of as residential, commercial, or industrial, but it also has environmental protection purposes as well. So in each zoning district, residential, commercial, industrial, um, if you go to your local ordinance, you're going to have a list of permitted uses. And this is a little excerpt from um, Anne Arundel County's commercial district. So commercial districts are graded, you know, between one and four, depending on whether we're talking about sort of an office park or we're talking about something heavy commercial where you're going to have sort of the, the noisy, smelly uses that are going to, you know, sort of, you know, create problems for adjoining landowners. And so in each one of those zoning districts, you're going to have permitted, conditional, or special exception uses. And those are, you know, referenced here on this chart. And there's also an A, which is an accessory use to a business complex. Um, permitted uses are allowed by right. You can come in and, you know, do whatever you need to do in accordance with the bulk regulations, which I'll get to. Conditional use is you're gonna go to a different part of the code and you're gonna see, okay, if you're gonna have an assisted living facility, you need to meet a you know, four or five, 10, 12 additional criteria. If you do, you can proceed sort of as a by right um, development. And then on the other end of the spectrum is a special exception, which is confusingly sometimes referred to as a conditional use. But in my jurisdiction, it's a special exception, which is a use that is known to have inherent adverse impacts. But the legislature has sort of said, we know that it's gonna have these impacts, we're gonna allow it in these certain zones, but you're gonna to have to go through a special approval pro process, which is called a special exception, and it's and it's public, and you're gonna to have to prove certain criteria are met in order to get approval. So each use, in addition to whether it's you know in the code as permitted, conditional, and the conditional use criteria, also has what we call bulk regulations. What is the minimum density? How big does the lot have to be? How far do you have to be set back and you know, sometimes it includes landscaping requirements. It all depends on your jurisdiction, but it generally controls on your property how, how much you can develop, what is it going to eventually look like. In addition to the Euclidean zones, which are sort of the um, recre or residential, commercial, industrial, we also have overlay zones. And I have here um, a map of the Chesapeake Bay critical area, which is, I mentioned, the thousand foot buffer around the critical area and we have green which is the resource conservation area yellow which is the um the limited development area and then red which is the intensely development area so if you're looking at a piece of property you see that it's residential 
and but you realize oh it's within a thousand feet of the chesapeake bay well i have to go to this other map and figure out am i ida am i rca and then you're going to have a whole nother layer of um, zoning restrictions that and development restrictions that go on your property so you always have to be aware of overlay zones um, they can be conservation oriented or they can be growth oriented um, for example certain areas might be classified as a growth management area or a town center where the county has decided this is where we want to have new development you know and, and in doing so we're going to give benefits to developers so in annapolis we have a, an area that was you know an old shopping center and you're probably going to see this in a lot of jurisdictions as malls go by the wayside with amazon in order to you know get a beneficial redevelopment of those properties the counties will allow increased height they will allow you to have many more units than you would normally be able to you know and the, the sort of provide all sorts of incentives to have a, a new development in an area that might be a little bit more expensive to develop than a typical greenfield so um in the local zoning ordinance we have bulk regulations we might have regulations associated with an overlay zone a lot of times you are not going to you or your clients are not going to be able to meet those requirements and if you can't you can go to the local government and ask them for a variance and a variance is a you know a, you know you're allowed to vary the the requirements of anything in the zoning article unless there's a express prohibition on variances which sometimes there are you do need to be aware that you know certain certain things that are considered you know sacrosanct you know critical area open space that sort of thing the local government can say no variances um in in a practical sense variances are granted very frequently um i represent a lot of the developers and oftentimes it's sort of assumed that you'll get through this process but if you look at the actual legal standard and this is across jurisdictions Variances are actually intended to be to be difficult, and the standard is very difficult. You have to first prove that there's something unique, some unique physical characteristic of your lot. Is it extremely long? Is it you know filled with hills? There's a stream valley in the middle with, that makes it impossible to develop in accordance with the zoning regulations. Alternatively, you can show that there are exceptional circumstances, which you know is sort of a vaguely defined term, and people can you know create what they will with that. With that. Which is great for lawyers. So, um, so those are sort of the, the threshold, you know, tests that you have to meet, and and those are pretty tough. And then the next one is the minimum necessary to afford relief. You have to show me you've avoided and minimized, you know, you've tried to do your development in accordance with zoning regulations, and you need this variance of 25 feet from the 50 foot setback in order to, you know, make reasonable use of your lot. You also have to show that it's not going to alter the essential character of the neighborhood. You know. You don't want a whole bunch of houses along a city street that are all set back 50 feet and then yours is 10 feet from the side road i mean that would alter the look of the street and that's sort of what the what the hearing examiner or the planning commission or board of appeals would consider and also you know talking about private property rights you, your variance cannot impact your adjacent property owner your neighbor's ability to develop their property and then there's always this catch-all because we're talking about the police power that you know that your variance request can't be detrimental to the public health safety and welfare so that's sort of a catch-all that as you if you in, if you're in private practice that'll often be um a challenge from people who are opposing your development that's sort of a, a way that they can you know bring in all sorts of different arguments so if you don't like your zone you can request a rezoning but again, with variances, it's a pretty difficult standard. Um, you have to either prove that there's been a change in the character of the neighborhood since the last comprehensive rezoning, or that there was a mistake, meaning that the council or the legislature who adopted the zoning map made a mistake of fact or law. There was something that they overlooked. Um, and that, that's a pretty difficult standard because, you know, as you know about challenging legislative enactments, I mean, there's there's a lot of deference given to the, the legislature and there's a lot of assumption that they knew what they were doing. So one way that it might come into play is I had a case where we had a property, there was a, a large portion of it was zoned open space and it turned out there was an error in the FEMA floodplain map. And so typically areas that are in a floodplain surrounding the stream are zoned open space. But in actuality, the map had been drawn in error and we were able to use our engineer and environmental experts to show that 
actually the floodplain was much more limited, so we were able to get a change in zoning from open space to a residential use to allow redevelopment. So that's sort of a, that that's more of a slam dunk than you would normally get with a rezoning, and it's, it can be difficult. So there's also um, non-conforming uses, and this this provides a little bit of a um, constitutional safety valve. Um, let's say you have an old contractor's yard that happens that happens pretty frequently you know there's contractors who come and they store you know uh, building supplies and trucks and things like that and sort of can be a a noisy you know nuisance type use but if this contractor's yard has been in your family for 50 years um, and you know it was in existence at the time that zoning was enacted you can show that we are a legal non-conforming use that means you were in existence before and you were entitled to stay in existence as long as you don't intensify or increase your non-conforming use. And non-conforming uses, that's one area that does, the, those ordinances do change pretty, pretty drastically from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So it would depend where you are, you'd wanna look at that pretty closely. And then um, special exceptions, which, which I men mentioned are the presumptively uh, permitted, pre presumptively appropriate uses, but um, with inherent adverse effects. And those actually give rise to a lot of zoning appeals. So zoning hearings. Um, these, you know, what Sarah was saying is, is so right on because, you know, these are, you know, relaxed proceedings oftentimes before a lay board of appeals, but these constitutional overlays are so important for your clients because it's one of these situations I always say to my clients, be careful what you ask for. You know, you might get a situation where maybe, you know, nobody shows up. Well, what if the, what if the notice was defective? What if people within 100 feet who were supposed to get notice didn't get notice? If they didn't get proper notice, you might have won, but you're going to lose on appeal. So you always want to make sure that you are double checking the notice provisions, making sure everyone gets what they need, that the sign is properly posted. That's another way that everyone will get notice of a zoning hearing. At the property, you're gonna see a big old sign that says notice of subdivision or notice of variance or whatever the hearing is. And you, you have to, you as the lawyer on the team really need to work with your engineers or property owners to make sure that everything is done right because that's a very easy way to lose your, your case on appeal. Um, public participation, you know, like, like Sarah said, these hearings are open. You don't have to be a person who is entitled to notice to participate. You know, at the end of your case, the board's going to open up to questions from everybody and, and everyone's allowed to say whatever they want. And you just generally have to make the best of it. And a practice pointer for you, if you're in private practice and you have a lot of citizen opposition, you do have to be very careful and conscious that your role as a, as a lawyer, you need to advocate for your client, but you also don't want to be too adversarial and crush public participation. It's a balance and it's something that you learn over time and, and going to the boards of appeal and planning commission hearings are a really good way to watch seasoned land use practitioners handle these situations. So that's, I actually enjoyed that part of it. So depending on what your jurisdiction is, you might go to a hearing examiner first, you might go to a planning commission, and then ultimately most people end up with a board of zoning appeals. Um, most of those are lay boards. So you can have, you know, a school teacher, businessman, they, they tend to be, they tend to fluctuate over time, people come and go, and they don't necessarily have to have any land use expertise in Maryland. The land use article provides that all of the boards and appeals members are required to go through a training. But I'll tell you, most of the time, you're, I mean, you're presenting new facts to people who don't know. Um, and everyone comes in with their own biases. And that's something that's also really important to you as a lawyer presenting your case. You need to get to know these people. You need to know Mr. So-and-so lives on the river and he's very sensitive to environmental issues. You need to address his concerns through your case. And it's really, that's one of the things that I think makes this practice so interesting. Um, so I wanted to talk about what happens after the zoning decision a little bit. Um, issues of standing, the standard of review um, for judicial review of an administrative agency decision, the Board of Zoning Appeals and then some practical tips that I have from my private practice. So one important thing for standing is standing is very different 
at the boards of appeals versus um, on judicial review to the circuit court or your you know court of appeals for the first level of, of um, review of an administrative agency. To get in at the board of zoning hearing officer, or whatever, whoever it is, you just basically walk in and you sign your name. Then, then you're a party. But in order to maintain that appeal, if you're unhappy with the decision of the board of appeals, not only do you have to have been a party at the hearing that you're appealing, the decision, you also have to, in Maryland, be aggrieved. And aggrieved is you know, someone who had, you are somebody who is suffering some sort of damage from that decision, some sort of harm from that decision that's different from the public at large. So in Maryland, you can be prima facie aggrieved if you are an adjoining, confronting, or adjacent property owner. You, if you're the neighbor, you, you have standing. That's, that's pretty much it. And one of the other ways that they measure is, it, did the Board of Appeals send you a letter that says there's a hearing? If you're within 100 feet, 300 feet, you're pretty much gonna be prima facie aggrieved. But there's also a whole body of case law in Maryland and, and other jurisdictions that are that we have this category called almost prima facie aggrieved. So you don't live next door, but you are you suffer some sort of harm that's unique to you. But in this circumstance, with a prima facie aggrieved, the court presumes that you're um, that you're aggrieved. Almost prima facie aggrieved, the burden is on you to show that you are damaged differently than than the other public. And this is this becomes on appeal a very hot issue. And it's as a lawyer, you're always looking to evaluate the people who are appealing your case. Do they have standing? Am I able to get them out on a motion to dismiss based on standing? Because if you can avoid revisiting the merits, that's great for everyone. <laughs> and then also one one thing to be aware of is, and this really varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, is the concept of organizational standing, such as for a nonprofit group um, in Maryland. It, you know, the, the, the courts look at whether you have a member who is um, a joining confronting property owner. Does the organization itself own property that's impacted differently? And it's uh, more of a fact based test. So judicial review when in Maryland, the circuit court looks at what the Board of Appeals did, what they, how they decided the variance, how they decided the special exception. It's very deferential. Um, just like you know, many areas of administrative law, not just land use, um, the the boards, uh, the board or the administrative agency's determinations of fact are given extreme deference, unless it is clearly erroneous, meaning that there was not enough evidence to make it fairly debatable. All of these terms are terms of art, and they're kind of thrown around. Um, then, then the court's not going to revisit. You know, the Board of Appeals heard that environmental expert, they heard the engineer, they heard the neighbors, and they made a decision based on the facts. As to issues of law, though, there isn't any deference generally if the board made an error of law. But there is sort of a gray area where if you're the Board of Zoning Appeals, you're presumed to have some knowledge about the process. You're presumed to understand these basic concept of Euclidean zoning and special exceptions. So there is a little bit of deference that the, the agency is given a little bit of a pass on implementing their own regulations. It really just depends on the court and the judge that you're with and how they how they feel about those standards of review. You know, there are standards, but not everyone sticks to them. Um, there's also this sort of interesting concept of what we call impermissible change of mind, which I think people like to talk about more than it actually exists. It's sort of a form of estoppel. If a zoning board of appeals has, has seen this case before based on almost the exact same circumstances and facts, it would be a basis of appeal if they decided this case differently than they did in the past. And, and lawyers love to make appeals based on impermissible change of mind. In, in reality, it doesn't work out that well. Because <laughs> there's when you're talking about land, I mean, there's always something different. There's always different factors. So that's something to be aware of. So my, my tips for if you're ever going to become a private practitioner, Make sure that you are aware of not just the statutory standards in the local ordinance, but also every every state has a huge body of land use law. For, for example, my site, my favorite case, I have two cases pending at the Maryland Court of Special Appeals on Schultz v. Pritz, which is the seminal case in special exception law in Maryland. And it, it arguably imposes an additional standard that in addition to meeting the, the criteria in your local ordinance, you have to 
So you also have to show that the special exception use at this particular location within the zoning district doesn't have an, unreason an inherently um, more objectionable impact to the surrounding communities than it would elsewhere in the zoning district. It's stay tuned in the next year as I <laughs> <laughs> debate that with my former boss, Judge Harrell on the Court of Appeals. So, um, so issues of due process, which Sarah um, mentioned, you know, be careful what you ask for. You know, you might get a pass, but it might come back to haunt you. Um, know that there's flexible rules of evidence at a at, before the Board of Appeals. You know, it's the it, hearsay it can be admissible as long as it's probative to the board. Um, you know, it's it's pretty relaxed as far as authenticating documents, all the things that you're learning about the rules of evidence which is kind of a nice thing <laughs> from a practitioner because it just makes it much more comfortable in terms of the flow of the hearing. It's, it's just, it's a little bit easier than preparing for a trial. Um, I already mentioned the fact that your, your boards of appeals are gonna be people who don't have expertise. And there, there's often this concept of zoning by plebiscite. And this is mentioned in case law a lot in Maryland. And that the idea is that zoning is not supposed to be a popularity contest. You might have a thousand people at the hearing who are opposed to your development, but that is not supposed to be the test. The test is what did the what did the comprehensive plan say? What how is this zone? How are the um, standards applied? So that's that's something you'll see often, and, and we will often object to you know sort of just NIMBY type. Um, objections to a, a, a proposal. It must, the test is what the standards are in case law and in the ordinance, and it's not just what is popular. And then finally, expert testimony, which Sarah mentioned, and sort of my favorite um, part of working in land use is that I get to work with engineers and architects and lighting experts and landscapers and and working with experts is so fun, but you know, just you don't, again, it's sort of the flexible rules of evidence. You don't have to do Fry Reed, you don't have to do Dober. You, it's more uh, casual when you're presenting your expert testimony, but you still have to qualify people as experts and they have to have, you know, reasonable credentials. So, um, we mentioned comprehensive plans. I wanted to touch on just sort of the the business side, the practical side. Um, there are, and I think there's increasing case law looking at whether comprehensive plans or general development plans are regulatory tools. Do they have the same effect as an ordinance or, or don't they? And there is at least one case in Maryland that says when the general development plan is implemented through those subdivision regulations that Sarah mentioned to such an extent that it, it becomes you know, completely inherent into the, in, it, it just, it, you know, gets into every aspect of the zoning, it can rise to the level of a regulatory device. That's a very caveated decision, but I expect to see more and more of that, you know, over the next few years. Um, one issue that I see very frequently from my clients is that the general development plan is updated every 10 years. And as we know, having lived through the last 10 years, business cycles change on a dime. You know, the, the demand for multifamily, the demand for commercial ebbs and flows with the economy. And so oftentimes you have a disconnect, which is why you end up in the process of rezoning when when the general development plan is not in sync with what the market bears. So that's that's always an issue and and something that I could see in the future sort of requiring additional, more frequent um, general development plan review. And, and And this sort of, you know, this captures the idea of changing societal needs, like the general development plan from 10 years ago wouldn't have captured the, you know, the concepts of solar, wouldn't have concept, you know, medical marijuana, uh, opioid crisis, all of these things. And, you know, they, these, these concepts are important to the general development plan and public health, safety and welfare is the, the essence of these plans. And um, as we mentioned, the, the general development plan is the basis for all comprehensive rezoning, which is done on the heels of the general development plan. So um, Diana's gonna talk a little bit about solar development, but I wanted to mention medical cannabis facilities. Um, it's something that is is happening you know, all over the country. Um, it's coming down generally from state statute, uh, which says you know, we are going to permit uh, cultivation, processing, selling of medical cannabis within these certain um, constraints. 
and the state law might provide buffers to schools or other sort of non-compatible uses, but it, they generally, across the country where they're allowed, allow the local or the local legislature, county, city, whoever it is, they allow them to impose additional restrictions as long as they're within the police power. And we're seeing a lot of case, case law where people are challenging the local legislation, put, which oftentimes puts more restrictions on the siting of the medical cannabis facilities, but generally they're not very successful because as long as, as long as there's not conflict with, or you know, express you know, direct preemption issues, the, the, local, um, the local counties and cities are given a lot of latitude to protect public health, safety and welfare and property values with these sort of um, suspect classes of use that, that not just medical cannabis, but you know anything that, that's sort of new and can be um, problematic or even just perceived problematic. So just as my, my last slide, I wanted to give you sort of an overview of you know, what it's like for me on a daily basis um, being a land use practitioner. And you know, most of my clients are development companies, they are homeowners, they are architects, they are people who are um, developing land. I also represent a lot of nonprofits, um, you know, community groups, homeowners associations, everyone's involved with you know, these, these sorts of land use decisions. And you are often in, in land use practice, you're, you're counseling your clients, you're, you're trying to create strategies for getting developments done within a certain period of time. You're working with, you know, the real estate team um, and, and making sure that your client is totally on board with all of the important things that we've talked about, um, the, the importance of notice. You know, a lot of clients want to get things done and your job is to push back and make sure that they get it done and they get it done the right way. And, you know, you're reaching out, you're oftentimes in the role of a lobbyist. You're you're, you're going to the county council people and you're saying, you know what, we could use a zoning text amendment that would allow, you know, commercial marinas here because there's not enough commercial marinas. So you end up doing a lot of lobbying and it's it's something I didn't anticipate going into this field, but I, but I really enjoy. And then I think what my favorite part is that you get to do the, the litigation side as well, the appeals. So after you go to the circuit court, of course, you have by right appeals to your court of special appeals and then on from there. And so you get a you get a good mix of all different aspects of of the practice. And that's really what I enjoy. So thank you. There you go. So good afternoon. Again, I'm Diana Norris. I'm in-house counsel for the Piedmont Environmental Council. We are a nonprofit located in Warrington, Virginia. We cover nine counties doing land conservation and environmental advocacy. Okay. And before we jump into eminent domain, uh, we just wanted to briefly touch on solar as one of the sort of evolving land use issues. Um, you can speak to obviously how it's dealt with in Maryland. Virginia's slow on change, um, if you haven't noticed. And so there is no state code that deals with solar on a land use basis, okay? So right now it's sort of a hodgepodge of ordinances um, on the county level. But the General Assembly is starting to pick up that something needs to be done. Um, as an advocate of alternative energy, that's fantastic. But at the same time, how does it fit into the police powers that are given to the localities? And what we're seeing, we've seen two bills that really deal with the land use um, issue. One was to take the police power away from the localities altogether. Basically, the Commonwealth said, no, no, we'll figure it out for you all. Okay. You do not have a decision. You don't have decision-making powers when it comes to the siting of solar generation facilities. That died. Then we had another bill that came in that said, okay, let's interpret and define solar as an agricultural use that literally we're harvesting the sun's rays. OK, agricultural uses in the Commonwealth are largely exempted from zoning that too failed. So we're still stuck with localities making the decisions. And it's a little bit it just, just simply depends on where you are. How does Maryland deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I think on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction, we're seeing a range um, mm -hmm. from directly, you know, labeling solar farms as farms and agricultural uses mm -hmm. and letting them go. 
to the whole other side of calling them an industrial use and you know restricting them to industrial office park zones and in my county where we are now there's been so much conflict over which approach is the right approach we're under a complete zoning more a solar moratorium while mm -hmm. the county figures out which way it's going to go mm -hmm. yeah and so and now um counties have the right to discuss this in their comprehensive plans and that mm -hmm. has a part in the public service commission's process previous that changed in the legislature not this session but last the session before so previously regardless of what a county had um in their comprehensive plan most of them didn't have anything because like we said they're mm -hmm. not many cases many many years old so this wasn't even contemplated um, the counties were able to participate in the Public Service Commission's process, but if the county said, we don't want this, the Public Service Commission could rule completely opposite and they could approve it. Now that has changed and counties are given some land use authority and a, a right you know, for a voice in the process through the comprehensive planning, but that's just at the very beginning since it's a fairly new law. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Which just shows there's plenty of opportunity when you all are thinking about careers in land use law. Energy infrastructure is a huge and always evolving area. 20 years ago, I didn't think I'd be sitting on a panel talking about solar and land use. Um, and that actually segues later into our discussion about gas pipelines. So let's just jump into a huge area of law, which there's no way I will be able to cover in 25 minutes, but that's okay. We'll start eminent domain. For people who care about Latin, it actually translates into supreme lordship, which sounds pretty ominous, and it can be. But it's a huge area of law. And what I wanted to cover today, any uh, good lawyer will start at the US Constitution. Sarah set me up perfectly. We'll segue into a seminal case um, called Kilo versus City of New London, which was decided in 2005 by the Supreme Court of the United States. Then I wanted to touch briefly on um, how some of the states reacted to the Kelo decision. Um, Virginia went ahead and amended its constitution uh, in Article 1, Section 11. And then I wanted to talk a little bit more about what I do and the practical level, um, and that is talking about the project, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, which has um, been going through an eminent domain proceeding. Okay. So starting with the Constitution, as Sarah mentioned, there's a provision. Um, it was added to the U.S. Constitution in 1791 as part of the Bill of Rights. So you can imagine the historical context of why this was added into our Constitution. Nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Okay, so in that one phrase, it's a power, but it's also a limitation on governmental powers to take private property for public use. It has created 200 years of, of case law, uh, which we are not covering right now. Um, but just think about those phrases and the questions that can arise. What is a public use? What is private property? What can be taken? I've been involved in litigation where can a scenic view shed? I buy a piece of property on a mountaintop. I have an amazing view of the Appalachian Trail. A transmission line is put right in front of the trail. My view is shot. My val the value of my property is now reduced because I no longer have that view. Was there a taking? Okay. When does a taking occur? Is it when a survey is completed or when a project is filed at the planning commission um, within the county? When does that occur? Okay. And then how does a court measure just compensation? If any of you are soccer fans or actually read the Washington Business Journal, there was an article uh, this weekend about DC United and their new stadium. So that was actually a friendly taking where the District of Columbia found the property. They negotiated over price. They said, we'd like to seize your property for this new stadium. The landowner said, okay, we'll see. And they started haggling over price. They could not agree on a price. So it was seized. And they recently went to court and talked about how much this is worth. What is the just compensation? DC offered $21 million. The landowner thought that was not enough. They have competing appraisers. Um, it's quite, a, talk about another um, area of practice when you get to that just compensation level. Um, it is very technical, um, but a huge uh, area of opportunity. 
Um, and they finally, the court uh, rewarded the landowner with $32 million. So it was probably worth it to go to court. Okay. <laughs> so we have that basis. We have the United States Constitution, the Fifth Amendment about um, private property and the way it can be taken. But how has that Fifth Amendment and um, eminent domain played out? Um, as Sarah mentioned, we have the 14th Amendment, which gave that power to the states. The states have codified eminent domain powers, and Kilo was one of those. So what happened in Kilo? Basically, the city of New London authorized an integrated development plan to revitalize a waterfront area, okay? There was no claim of blight. You often see in condemnation cases um, a claim of bl blight where it's a crime-ridden area, it's a health public safety issue, so we are going to go in and condemn this piece of property. There was no claim of blight in Kilo. In fact, it was a neighborhood. It was a neighborhood that had people, grandparents who had lived there their entire lives, okay? There were 90 different Fort Trumbull landowners who were affected. 15 of them refused to sell, including Susan Kilo, who has now, the now famous Little Pink House. It's a Little Pink Victorian home, okay? And the, the Code of Connecticut allows a private body, a development corporation, to be the condemning authority. Okay, so you have a private body coming in and condemning a neighborhood for revitalization. 15 refused to sell, and so they went to court. The Connecticut State Supreme Court interpreted that statute and went ahead and approved all 15 takings. Okay, and if you think about it though, if you go into the details, the plan, that revitalization plan, was actually centered around Pfizer. It's a large corporation that was coming in because it wanted a new headquarters on that waterfront. So the uses were commercial, office space, residential, and recreational. And that was their justification for this taking. So what happened? Well, obviously, the people, uh, the landowners lost in state court. So they went ahead and they got pro bono representation through the Institute of Justice mm -hmm. and went to the U.S. Supreme Court. And in a very contentious opinion, with Justice Thomas leading the dissent in a five to four ruling, the U.S. Supreme Court, in the interpretation of the Connecticut statute, upheld the takings. Okay. And so how did they do it? What was their justification? They basically said that public use, again, in the Connecticut statute, but you think again about the U.S. Constitution, what is a public use? What they interpreted as a public use is also a public purpose, which negates that need for that immediate use by the public. It broadens that term. So what can now was a public use is now public purpose. OK, they also said that economic development and private development can be interpreted as a public purpose. Again, a broadening, but it it falls in line with a series of cases that the U.S. Supreme Court had justified as public purposes. OK, they also said that. The condemnation occurred through that Connecticut statute, and they give great deference to the legislative body's decisions on takings, all right? But the story doesn't end there with Kilo. Pfizer pulled out in 2009. Most of the homes were destroyed. The little pink house was actually relocated to another part of, New, of uh, the city of New London. The plan fell through completely. And that neighborhood is now barren, except for it's now home to feral cats. Okay. They are thinking now of putting a memorial up to this case. So it's all part and parcel of these types of proceedings. Okay. So as you can imagine, there was um, a reaction to Kilo. Almost half of the states in the US enacted post kilo reforms. What did Virginia do? Virginia went ahead and amended its constitution, which is no small feat. To be really clear, we had to go through ballot initiatives, legislative processes. It took 
a couple of years to do so. And it's very complicated, as you can imagine, with kilo. It's not black and white, okay? I'm not gonna read the entire Constitution of Virginia, but this section, let's go through a couple of the um, important elements. What they did is um, they went ahead and included that private property shall not be also damaged. It's also taken in its entirety. Sarah talked about physical and regulatory, but you also can get compensation when, you're, when your property is damaged through a taking, which is important. It limited the amount of property that could be taken only that property that may be taken that is necessary. So the burden on the condemner is to show how much property is necessary, okay? It also included compensation for lost profits and lost access. Um, and with those are defined by state code, creating a whole new area for case law. What is lost profits? What is lost access? We are busy, to put it mildly. But most importantly, from a private property's view, is that, again, the right to hold private property is fundamental. You don't have a lot of fundamental rights. This is considered a natural and fundamental right. Virginia is a big private property state, a commonwealth, um, and this just added to it. So the case law is still obviously evolving after we've amended the Constitution, all right? Now, there are always exceptions or qualifications to the rule. Throughout these condemnation powers, both the federal government and state governments allow certain companies these condemnation powers, okay? We wouldn't have most of our infrastructure if we did not have these public service companies that are able to condemn. With that being said, it continues to be interpreted. Again, we think about DC and the stadium for DC United versus the railroads back in the 1800s, okay? So what is a public service company? A public service company is one that obviously is supposed to deliver public services. Service is supposed to be essential to the public interest, okay? So let's go to a little bit of a case study, one that I'm working on currently, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. The pipeline is a $5.5 billion project developed by four energy companies and is supposed to deliver shale gas to markets in Virginia and North Carolina. And when you see the map, it'll give you some context, okay? The cost of the project, because these are mostly utility companies, are they're able to wrap those costs and into their bills to their customers. So don't think that they're spending $5.5 billion out of the generosity of their hearts. They are going to pass down to their customers and they are guaranteed a 14% rate of return on this project, okay? So here's the map, as you can see. Starts in West Virginia, ends in North Carolina, though um, there is supposition that it will uh, extend into South Carolina as well. Okay, and Norfolk, if you have any, uh, if you've been to Norfolk, it's a port. So this this could have this could be expanded. Let's put it that way. These are not pictures of this pipeline, but I wanted to give you an idea. It's a 150 foot right of way easement over property. Um, this one was in, uh, yeah, Giles County. This one was actually on a piece of property that the organization I work for, PEC, owns in Fauquier County. Columbia Gas um, had an existing right-of-way on our property. They wanted to put another, uh, some redundancy, they wanted to put another pipeline um, in the right-of-way. It took us years of battling back and forth with Columbia about um, how to manage that proposal. Um, there's not too much you can do when they already have a right of way, but a pre from a practitioner's point of view, these right of ways were put on these properties back in the 1920s. They are one page documents, read them closely. There's a lot of interpretation in those old utility right-of-ways and a lot of opportunity for negotiation, and it's a real opportunity. So 
here we are with the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and how does it relate to eminent domain? There's the Natural Gas Act. It's a federal act that authorizes the use of eminent domain. It's 15 USC, section 717 to 717Z. It provides that a natural gas company must obtain a certificate of public convenience and necessity from the Federal Energy, Energy Regulatory Commission, often referred to as FERC, which regulates the construction of interstate pipelines, not intrastate, interstate. So that's why the math is very important, okay? Virginia regulates only intrastate pipelines, so the distribution parts. Um, the Natural Gas Act, the Federal Act, does the interstate um, uh, construction. Part of that analysis and the approval of that certificate, the applicant has to show the need for the project. That's often where PEC and environmental groups come in. We often will go in and say, wait, where's the need? Prove to us the need. How is, this, how is that 14% rate of return the need? So we'll talk about that in a little bit. 15 USC 717H provides that the natural gas companies holding these certificates have condemnation powers to obtain the easements for pipelines, so that 150 feet going over private property. And in October of 2017, FERC went ahead and issued that certificate for the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. In a very rare situation, we had one of three commissioners dissent. That almost never happens. And what was her dissent based on? It was based on an inadequate environmental review. It was also based on the energy's company, energy company's reliance on precedent agreements. And what does that mean? They came in and said, of course we need this pipeline. Look at all these companies that have signed agreements with us to purchase the natural gas. And she said, wait a second, talk to me about those those agreements. Well, as it evolved, it ended up those a good portion of those antecedent, those precedent agreements were subsidiaries mm -hmm. of those four companies. The two commissioners said that complies with the statute, and we're going to allow it. Lafleur said that's not enough anymore. So where are we now? <laughs> Where we are now is PEC um, and the landowners, uh, certain landowners who have been affected by the Atlantic Coast Pipeline are taking FERC to court. And what are we um, claiming? We're claiming that there's a lack of substantial evidence demonstrating need, again, that reliance on the precedent agreements. The Natural Gas Act requires the applicants to comply with NEPA. We are alleging that it was a deficient environmental impact statement, and so they have violated NEPA. We're also claiming that they violated the Natural Gas Act, that they've granted the certificate, those condemnation powers, but all the state permits have not been obtained. So they've condemned the properties, building, they've started cutting down the trees, but the state hasn't authorized and given all the permits that it needs to be. So we're, we're claiming that that's premature and that until the state has completely certified this project, they should not be starting construction. And then as Sarah and Megan spoke about, there's some due process and constitutional claims as well. So we've gone ahead and um, there, there's a, when you're suing FERC, <laughs> uh, there's quite a bit of procedure and process involved. Um, we're actually refiling uh, probably this week. Um, so it is, it is quite a process. So where are we today? As I mentioned, we've gone ahead and filed our claim against FERC. There is, um, they had to get a permit, a special use permit, like we've discussed, but on a federal level, level with the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. Fish and Wildlife at first went ahead and authorized that permit. They've actually now revoked that permit, which is incredibly rare too. So that's going through its process. 
We've also sued the Forest Service because the Forest Service permitted the project across the George Washington National Forest and the Monongahela National Forest. And we're claiming that that process was not correctly followed. And finally, we are suing the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality because as I was talking about the state permits, originally what the Virginia DEQ said, they're, they're responsible for the um, protecting water quality in Virginia. Originally what they said is we'll go ahead and allow this project because there's a federal permit. It's a blanket permit that basically allows these projects to continue. The DEQ through its codified authority is supposed to look at and analyze individually the water resources that are affected. And we're saying that federal permit, a blanket permit, does not meet that standard. And so we're taking the Virginia DEQ to court as well. It's a long battle, but it's worthwhile. And one of the, even if we don't win, we're going to try and improve the process. And that's half the battle at times. And we're already seeing that FERC has opened up a comment period in which it is looking at the way it permits natural gas pipelines. And it hasn't done that in over 20 years. And so it is a moment for governments, advocacy organizations, companies to opine on those processes and try to make that process better. So again, in 25 minutes, it's a little bit hard to um, summarize eminent domain, but I hope what you all take from this is that there is so much opportunity um, in this area of law, whether it be eminent domain, energy infrastructure, land use, private practice, government, advocacy, whatever it might be. It's really fascinating, and I hope you all find what triggers your interest. So that's all I have. Great, so I think we have some time for Q&A. Does anybody in the room want to start us off? <laughs> and as a reminder for those on GoToWebinar, please submit your questions through the questions box. Thank you for uh, that informative presentation. Uh, my question is, if people are interested in this as a career, what are the work-life realities and the compensation <laughs> typically? Thank you. Do you want me to answer from the private? I can answer from the private practitioner standpoint. Um, one of the nice things about, I, after law school, I did a clerkship and then I worked for a big firm downtown and I didn't do much land use and I came to my current firm to do land use. And one of the nice things about it is it's inherently local. And so most of the firms where you're gonna practice land use law are a smaller or regional firm. And so sort of better work-life balance and in, inherent to the firm size. Um, one other aspect to consider is a lot of these administrative hearings are at night. So if you're gonna go to the planning yeah. board, you have the commissioners or whoever, they have day jobs. So oftentimes you're at night. So if your work-life balance involves children, you know, that that's something certainly to consider. And I know people who have left the practice because the evening hearings did not work for their schedule. And also, be, what I sort of alluded to is you end up doing a lot of lobbying. Um, you have to be aware that as a land use practitioner, you have to know the elected officials. So you have to go to a lot of events. So you're, as opposed to like in a, maybe like a transactional practice, you, your your business development activities might be going to bar you know like an urban land institute or something like that. For me, my um, my extracurricular activities are extremely important. So I'm on the chamber of commerce board of directors, the state bar, environmental law you know section. People need in order to be relevant in in land use, you have to be out there and you have to know engineers, you have to know developers, and so it's sort of a constant process because unlike you know, certain practices where you have one client who services you for 30 years, like a pipeline company who pretty much does the same thing. My clients change pretty frequently. Not everyone's putting in a development, not everyone's, you know, 
you know, going to need you all the time. So it's sort of a constant pressure for you to get out there. And, and that's definitely something to be aware of. If you're an extrovert, you're like me, I love going to events and chatting with people. It's really fun. So that is, is excellent. Um, I think as far as compensation, uh, I mean, it's, I would say it's on the higher end of, you know, private practice for a regional firm. I mean, it's difficult to, for, you know, everyone understands the entry level salaries at a big firm are extremely high and, and you're not going to get that necessarily at a, at a, at a regional law firm. But I mean, I feel like I'm very fairly compensated for the work that I do and the, the flexibility I have in my life. I have a little bit of a different situation. Obviously, I have one client, and that's PEC. I went from private practice for seven years um, into being one of their lobbyists, and then I segued into their in-house counsel position. Um, and you know, I work for a nonprofit, so in Virginia, in rural Virginia, so um, it does not compete with DC prices, but that's fine. I live my job and I love my job and I'm incredibly lucky. And I know that. Um, and so, you know, I get up at four in the morning to do two hours of work so I can take my kids to school and I can pick them up from school. But then I do another hours of work or I go to a social event or whatever it might be. So I like that one on one with one client. Um, in the morning, I work on a personnel issue. Maybe I hire and fire. And in the afternoon I'm working on an eminent domain situation and in the middle of the day I'm doing land conservation where I'm closing on a conservation easement so I like that variety um, but it also goes to it helps if you're really interested in what you do instead of slogging it's hard I think it presents an opportunity for young lawyers obviously there's a range when we're talking about things um, but in some situations, you know, especially when you're talking about residential homeowners, they don't want to spend a lot on attorney's fees for some of these things. You know, they just wanted to put a pool in their backyard. They had no idea there was bulk regulations or, you know, they thought they, the business owner thought they'd be able to do something with the property. They've maxed out investing in this new business. They had no idea. They had to have a certain number of parking spaces. So they call the law firm and they say, I need help. I don't want to spend a lot of money. The partner's looking at the young lawyer in the office and going, <laughs> can you handle this? And I found that personally, and I think it's a great opportunity for young lawyers. So you should say yes and, um, you know, try it out and see if you like it. I, I think it, um, you know, are you, as a young lawyer, are you going to be litigating complex cases right out of the gate? Probably not. Can you go represent somebody and help them get their pool in their backyard? Maybe. And that's a win. And that's great. And you've made a client relationship and you've done something successful and firm got a little bit of money and now you have practical experience. And if you liked it, then, you know, you potentially have a path. So I would encourage people to think about it like that. Great, so we had a question, a few questions from the web. Um, Sarah, do you think with the openness slash fairness requirement postings will eventually move away from newspapers to another medium? Um, I hope so, just because it's incredibly expensive for um, towns and counties to continue to run these ads. I did um, municipal representation, so I represented small towns and I would always be calling them and saying, you gotta run that ad three times times they'd be like are you kidding me to how much this cost to run this three times I said yes but we gotta make sure everybody knows about this so yes I think in the future we're gonna get away from it and right now you know they're just trying to get the word out however they can roadside sign newspaper and maybe it's on the town website but I don't know if a 70 year old is really going to be looking at the town website or Twitter or Facebook so now we have to do it every single way but I think we're in the middle of an evolution on that great do we have another question in the room Uh, my name is Ian Hardman. I'm an intern here at ELI and an economics student at the University of Virginia. And um, I guess sitting here listening to you all talk about property rights, I can't help but think about uh, Ronald Coase's paper, The Problem of Social Cost, where he says that in the absence of transaction costs, the uh, property will, right will go to the highest value user. And um, I guess, you know, in reality, we all know there are high transaction costs. And I was wondering what you all think in practice are some of the highest transaction costs that prevent uh, property, property rights from ending up at the highest value user. 
That's a good, that's an excellent question there. I'm trying to think about what the biggest complaints I've heard from my clients lately, probably legal fees. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, in, in one of the, one way that, that property becomes almost useless is if you end up in a, a cycle of appeals. And we've had um, a number of very controversial developments that if, if there's a, you know, well-organized opposition group, you know, they can, with a pro bono attorney, they can go on forever. And, you know, legal fees can get up into the hundreds of thousands very quickly when you're going through administrative hearings and appeals. And they go up to the highest court and they go back down. And then they can go back up again and they can go down. We have one development on the Eastern Shore that has been, that is under construction now, but has been to the um, Court of Appeals in Maryland three times. And over 11 years. So I would say my clients complain mostly about litigation costs. I saw some unfortunate, um, I, I think it's unfortunate when I don't know why people have this idea that I like a piece of property, I'm going to sign the contract and then go to a lawyer to try to see what's going on with the transaction. Or I like a piece of property, I'm going to buy it and then we'll work out the zoning and planning stuff later. I hope we've gotten across to you today. It's not so easy to work out the zoning and planning stuff later. Um, this is not a very easy system to navigate, and it's not so easy to change things. So I hope, you know, if you have recently bought a piece of property, the contract is long, it has a lot of warnings, they're constantly updating that, and I know realtors take classes all the time, but I wish there was more sort of a public message that you need to do your homework before. Um, I helped a lot of people who were interested in buying property and I didn't always give them great news. Sometimes I would do the back, you know, the research and tell them the limitations, the restrictions that were there and then they ended up walking away. They were happy to pay me in that situation. That was money well spent rather than putting the money into the property and then figuring out they couldn't end up doing anything with it. Yeah, um, one other thing that I'll, I'll mention sort of, you know, a way that some of the transaction costs can get get addressed is through you know tax incentives when you know a lot of what I do is redevelopment in urban areas and oftentimes you have environmental issues hazardous materials that are inherent in the site but that the state is decided or the jurisdiction has decided that it's important for us to redevelop these properties and without incentives nothing will get cleaned up because it's going to cost too much to dispose of petroleum contaminated soils. So there are tax credits designed to incentivize and lessen the burden of those particular costs because if you're dealing with an environmentally contaminated property, not only do you have like cleanup costs, but you have the costs of environmental consultants to do your phase one and phase two environmental site assessments. You're going to be negotiating with the polluter to pay the incremental costs. I mean, there you're going to have to deal with environmental insurance. All of those costs in, impose a lot on the transaction and there's there's different ways that the counties can or the states can incentivize to, to lessen those costs. Yeah, tax incentives are a huge tool for PEC and in the Commonwealth to protect uh, land. Oh, one of the tools is a conservation easement where you get a tax credit for um, burdening your land with a conservation easement. But I will tell you, every year we're lobbying the General Assembly to protect that tax credit. Uh, it's a big part of the budget and it's a huge tool that continues to make Virginia the way it is, but we protect it. We have another question from the web. So someone has asked, um, we've talked a little bit about how you would recommend entering or breaking into the land use field, but what organizations would you recommend getting involved in? Well, there is a real estate and land use section of the bar um, in Maryland, and there's the environmental section. There's also an agriculture section. Um, young people get a break on all those, so take advantage of those breaks. I think they're great. Um, every year, the um, there's a land use institute that's put on by the Maryland State Bar Association, and that's a wonderful program. Um, usually, Judge Harrell's there. They talk about recent cases. There's a variety of experts, so I'd really take advantage of some of those bar um, resources. And I'm sure there's other ideas. Yeah, the local bar associations, again, because land use is inherently local, you, usually the county bar associations have a real estate and land use section. And that's a great way to meet other practitioners, understand what their practice looks like, because it really does vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. What what role the lawyers have in Montgomery County? 
the lawyers are involved in every single aspect from subdivision to sketch plan like everything has to be presented by a lawyer where in Mar when in Anne Arundel County a lot of it can be done by engineers so you need to get to know the engineers another um, opportunity is obviously trade groups so I'm a member of the Maryland Building Industry Association and also um, NAOP which is the National um, Association of industrial and office properties. And those are trade groups where you can get to know who the people are, who you'll be your clients and your experts. So, you know, the property developers and also the engineers and consultants. So getting in with those, those people is a really important way to break into the field. Also council of governments and uh, Virginia has the Virginia Association of County Organization, VACO. Um, they often will have symposiums, conferences, so um, joining those types of, or even just attending those types of meetings is a really educational way to do it as well. Yeah, and I also want to put in a plug for um, a, a group for the ladies. It's a group that have a local chapter, a Maryland chapter, it's called Crew Commercial Real Estate Women. And, you know, you can join as a, as a student or as a young practitioner, and it's not just Lawyers, but there are a lot of lawyers is similar to a trade group, but it, they do a lot of mentoring activities. And it's a, if you're interested in being in the real estate field and land use, it's a great organization. Do we have another question in the room? All right, we had um, one more for Megan and one more from for Diana online. So Megan, can you explain a bit more about the religious land use? <laughs> you, you said <laughs> I have not litigated a Ray Lupa case. I just know um, we, my firm actually does handle a lot of, um, we have a lot of church clients. And, you know, you sort of think about like, you know, church is like this little, you know, organization. But in actuality, I mean, these, these churches are huge organizations with tons of money and very sophisticated, you know, members of their their um, their board or their governing body, and they they entertain pretty complicated development projects. And oftentimes they're in residential neighborhoods or um, they're in areas where there's sort of a conflict. And, and one of the one of the difficult parts of developing a church facility is oftentimes traffic. So you have Sunday morning traffic with a congregation of thousands of people, and it becomes what uh, what people in the neighborhood would consider a real nuisance. But you know, Ray Lupa is, has its, you know, its, you know, roots in fair housing and discriminatory practices over time. You know, our country hasn't always had the best track record of treating, you know, religious uses fairly. So, um, you know, it, it basically protects them from discriminatory land use policies and and it's, you know, cases applying Ray Lupa have been so, so deferential um, to the point that, I mean, you would just, you would be surprised. For example, there's um, in Prince George's County around Andrews Air Force Base, the, the Air Force Base has imposed land use restrictions based on the probability of there being a plane crash. And there are current Ray Lupa challenges because there's churches in the path of this of the the crash zone and and so far they're having pretty good success of overcoming you know clear public health and safety um land use regulations on the basis of religious discrimination so i mean i would just say it i mean it's just a very extensive body of case law but um and it's always developing great thank you and Diana, in your work, how successful are people seeking payment for takings from scenic values? Uh, not very. Um, we were involved in a transmission line case back in 2008, uh, 2007. Um, it was a federal case and then it had state implications. And we did, we had many members who um, moved to the Piedmont area for the countryside, for the scenic view sheds. Um, and they felt that was wrapped into the value of their property and the, their quiet enjoyment. Um, and when this transmission line uh, came through, um, there were cases of what can we do um, because this this transmission line has has ruined our, our view um, and one of the cases basically said uh, and, and don't get confused because um, there are easements of light 
there's um, easements of view. Um, in Virginia, though, you have to have an interest in it. Okay, so if the transmission line is two miles away and my property sits on a mountainside and I can see directly at that line, that property, the, the transmission line is not on my property. Okay, and what the court basically said is that doesn't count uh, because you don't have an interest. Where is the interest in that view? Okay, there was a but. In some of the dicta, it did say, though, if you had a conservation easement on your property that protects a scenic view shed, then that is an interest in that scenic view shed, and that could possibly be compensated. We haven't quite gotten there because we haven't had one of those big transmission line cases. We haven't set it up quite yet, but it does add a possibility um, for someone whose view is ruined uh, through a large infrastructure project if you do actually have an interest um, in that scene at Shed, So to be continued. Yeah. In Maryland, um, I'm sure you're familiar with the case. There's a, an old Court of Appeals case that said Maryland you know, does not adopt what's called the ancient lights doctrine, right. effectively said. In Maryland, you do not own your view. You don't have a right to your view, and that comes up a lot of times on the water because yes. you know people want their beautiful unspoiled view and California especially yeah, right. you see those types of easements so yeah great thank you well thank you to our audience for joining us today and for your great questions I'm sure our panelists will have a minute at the end um, if you have any you'd like to go up and ask them we hope you will continue to think and learn about land use law you can stay up to date with our summer school series on our website, eli.org. And next Tuesday, we'll be diving into the Clean Water Act, so sign up today. An enormous thank you to our panel, Sarah, Diana, and Megan. Your vast knowledge on these topics has been fascinating and informative. We are so glad you joined us today. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.